Today's wish comes from Dan Poniprak. Dan is a leadership strategist, award-winning author, and keynote speaker who helps organizations and leaders improve performance, productivity, and overall engagement. He's delivered four TED Talks. Four, man, that is that is Iron Man level stuff. I've done one and that was hard. Four is next level. Has been recognized as HR Weekly's 100 Most Influential People in HR, Inc. Magazine's Top 100 Leadership Speakers, and Thinkers 50 Radar. Dan's work has appeared in Forbes and Harvard Business Review, and he's the author of five books, most recently, Work, Life, Bloom, How to Nurture a Team That Flourishes, and that's something we're going to talk about today. We're going to flourish together. Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, Joe. Thanks very much. Let's get the uh, the coffee going. Let's get the coffee going, and we'll get the guard intended to. So what do you wish more people knew? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's a laundry list. But specifically for our audience today, I believe that the concept of work-life balance is um, slightly mythical and about as useful as giving me a comb for my birthday because I'm quite bald. That's pretty much what I'd like to talk about today, if that's cool with you, Joe. It's cool with me. And now I'm not going to be able to unsee that metaphor because I feel like I'm I'm headed towards that direction, too. So, yeah. <laughs> Get, get, do not give for gifts this holiday season combs to neither me nor Dan for those of you <laughs> listening today. Uh, so let's unpack that a bit because the idea of work-life balance is still very firmly entrenched in organizations and the way they operate and in, in the way they believe and act. What are we getting wrong and what could we be doing better? Well, first of all, I mean, with all the goodest of intentions by uh, leaders and HR leaders as well, th there's nothing wrong with the idea of work-life balance. It's that our myopia inside the workplace is where it starts because we don't really do the best job when it comes to how we define a better, more positive, if you will, kind of work experience. And then by that point, we've forgotten what the life factors are. <laughs> And when we do that, we're actually talking about uh, what I joke around with, Joe, is a work-work imbalance model, not a work-life balance model. And so, for example, as a sidebar, when we start measuring employee engagement, we're already coining the human being an employee, and we've thrown life out the door. So there's dripping irony when we start talking, like maybe one of our values says, oh, we espouse work-life balance and look out for our team members. Yet we measure employee engagement and we kind of forget the fact that after 40 hours, quote, at work, there's another 128 about life. Yeah, there's a disconnect there and we're not really measuring for what matters. You call the book Work-Life Bloom, and I like the analogy that really runs throughout and in order for people to bloom, you identify there are work factors and there are life factors, as you noted, that really help contribute to that feeling of bloom, both in life and at work. Let's start with the work factors. Take us through, give us a drive-by of some of the most important factors that you identified in your research that contribute to that feeling. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. And the key word there is research. So I went around the world uh, to 11 countries, uh, 10,000 people, 5,000 leaders, 5,000 non-leaders, and said, what's making you tick? What doesn't make you tick? And so they got whittled down to these six work factors and six life factors. On the work side, there's kind of three that you need as a human being for it to be happening in your world of being, quote, an employee or team member. And there's kind of three organizational ones. So uh, trust, belonging, and feeling valued are kind of those individual work ones that you need. You need to feel as though your boss, your team trust you for, for your work, for what you bring to the table. Uh, whatever your identity is, you got to feel like you belong uh, within the workplace. And with your contributions and your effort, you need to be recognized and thus valued for what it is that you're doing. So that's the individual side. On the work factors that are more organizational, it's about purpose, strategy, and norms. Purpose is, does this place stand for something more than red tape, bureaucracy, and profit? Uh, does the strategy kind of make sense to me as a human being, but am I able to provide a little bit of feedback? And am I having a conversation with the team and the higher ups on where we're heading? And norms, the best way to describe that is, does it feel like nails on a chalkboard, the way we operate? 
or is it pretty fluid? Yes, there's going to be some bumps, but generally speaking, the operational norms are rather smooth, and that allows me to feel like, yeah, I'm connected to this place. So let's get into trust. That That is one of those factors that is hard to earn, easy to spend, right? And, yeah. and difficult to grow, right? So so within that, one one little research nugget that caught my attention, really struck me, was that over 90% of respondents to your surveys, including leaders and non-leaders, rated trust as highly important. Okay, no shocker there. But more than 60%, excuse me, less than 60%, less than 60% of leaders felt that they actually had a trusting workplace. So two-parter here for you. Why is this happening? And more importantly, are leaders part of the problem? <laughs> well, uh, First of all, yeah, it's happening. B, are leaders part of the problem? Absolutely. And C, actually, it's sort of a trick question here is, is there a fundamental attribution error between what leaders think is happening and what team members believe is happening to them? Mm. And so there's there's a disparity, right, between what leaders believe as is our workplace trusting. I mean, there's a big gap there of about 20-ish points between what a leader thinks and what a team member thinks. And they're not very strong to begin with, as you point out already, Joe. So one of the things we have to really think about, and it's, I mean, uh, subliminal, why I put trust first as the first work factor in the book, is that if you're, uh, <laughs> the word rust is nested inside of trust. So if you have a very rusting, trusting environment, mm. you're going to run into issues. Mm. And when leaders believe that they have created the trusting environment and the team members like, uh, actually, yo, boss, um, that's not how it works around here. Uh, I don't feel as though that you actually have my back. I don't feel I can speak up. Uh, there's sort of a culture of fear running around here. Did you know that, boss? That's where, you know, my spotty senses get up. I think we got a lot of work to do there still in our orgs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So becoming aware that you have a problem is the first step in solving that problem of trust. One one thing that uh, jumped out at me on the, on the life factor side uh, is that these are things that are just part of the everyday, I don't know, experience of, of being at work. And yet, as you pointed out, it's really not something that we as organizations, at least at an organizational level, tend to prioritize. We spend most of the time thinking about that other column. Take us through some of the life factors here. And within those factors, is there one that you found really mm. stands out? Yeah. So another six in this case, think of life as you as an individual, like your self-character uh, criteria. So you'll come to work with this, but you also leave work with it. And it's sort of the individual habits, attributes, behaviors, your muscles, maybe petals on the metaphorical uh, garden flower that you're uh, hoping to groom and, and bloom with. So the first one is uh, is meaning. Do I have a sense of meaning? Do I feel self-actualized ultimately? The second is relationships. So what's what's my network like? Both like what are my family relationships like for sure, but more so like how do I feel nurtured by others? Do I have go-to people? Do I have friends? Uh, can I count on a friend when I, I'm in that million dollar seat and up for a, a big prize? Um, Well-being is a huge one. So yes, you could argue, well, Dan, you were just talking about the myth of work-life balance. Yes, but well-being is nested inside of this blooming archetype and if we're not well, it's really hard to be well at work. Yeah. And then uh, four, five, and six, uh, skills. So I feel like I'm confident with where I am today, but where I'm going in order to build up my life, which is obviously part of my work as well. Agency. So do I have self-determination? Do I have the ability to make decisions? And then respect. So do I feel respected for what I am and what I'm trying to become uh, within this realm of, quote, life? Mm -hmm. And is there one of those factors that that seem to recur as a dominant factor, an important factor for people in their quest to bloom at work? Yeah, um, I mean, there's a couple, but the one I really like to hone in on today, Joe, is skills. Mm -hmm. So there are um, a heck of a lot of people that realize and have realized, and partially thank you to the pandemic, is that it's not so much about a career or life ladder, but it's more like a mosaic. It's like a quilt. And so what are we doing as human beings to sort of further our skill set so that we might pop up somewhere else later in life, partly in later in work? And so if you're having an open, honest, uh, kind of trusting, 
mosaic-like conversation with your team member about what their pros are, their cons, what their likes are, their dislikes, where they want to go uh, today, short-term, medium-term, long-term. And if you're a leader, having those type of skills conversations about where that individual may want to go, I mean, that's just where you're then building in the trust, a sense of belonging, feeling valued on the work side. So from a life factor perspective, I see that uh, the genie is out of the bottle with the skills life factor. And there are more and more and more people who are actually wanting to have these conversations to build up their repertoire, to build up that mosaic. So it's not so much about a ladder, but experiences. So leaders do play a, a primary role, I mean, an important role in the in the cultivating of this work-life bloom so that people feel like those two those two factors, the work factors, the life factors are, are really operating in tandem with one another so that they're feeling their fullest selves, being their best selves as often as possible. How can leaders actually go ahead and measure for that? Once they've got the right priorities and they're looking at the right qualities and drivers, what are some ways that leaders can actually become more intentional without, I guess, proverbially tending that garden and making sure that all those conditions are just right? Well, the good news, Joe, is that I'm trying to uh, do as much as I can for free. You don't have to buy the book. So if you just go to worklifebloom.com extras, you're going to have all this stuff for free. So I've provided coaching guides for leaders uh, that help them through what I call the soil test and another section called the water test. The soil test is effectively you doing sort of a pH balance test and asking certain questions in your weeklies, your biweeklies, your monthlies, both your individual, your team meetings, et cetera, about these work and life factors. It really, to me, and what I've certainly seen in the research and the focus groups comes down to, okay, if you're a boss, are you having dialogue with your individuals? Do you know where they sit? Uh, not whether they're engaged or disengaged, because that's certainly not helpful, but how they feel, how they feel with these certain life factors and work factors. And if one or a couple aren't going well, well, what is it that they might need? And it's not to make them more high performing. I mean, the whole point is obviously we want performance, but the point is life and work have ups and downs. And if that individual leader is absolutely abhorrently um, unaware of where the individual sits and how they feel with some of these work and life factors, maybe, for example, Joe, they've moved towns. Maybe they moved from Cleveland to Kansas City, and it's a big enough role there. They're like, I don't know anyone. And all of a sudden now, now the relationship factor has gone down. Their sense of feeling respect in that town has gone down. Maybe they've gone into a new office and they're not feeling that they trust anyone yet or that they're valued, yet their boss remains in Cleveland and they're having one-on-ones over Zoom and Teams, what have you. Well, if you're not having that soil test conversation, so to say, with the team member, how will you know how they're feeling? And will they be able to be, quote, their best? It's highly doubtful. It's certainly not going to be helpful if you don't know. What I really like about the metaphor is that it puts the onus on the leader to make sure that he or she is actually putting in the time and the attention and the intention to actually <laughs> look and see what's happening, to notice and to actually tend that garden. Gardens don't grow by themselves and teams don't flourish or bloom by themselves either. Yeah. I mean, you've got, you're in charge of um, you know, testing the soil, so to say. You also have a watering can there, but you got your own tool shed of garden tools. And so these are the chances for you, again, metaphorically, of course, right? To sort of put on your garden gloves and just say, you know what, I've been there before. Or I can help you in the right direction, point you in the right direction of some other gardeners that might help tend to your own garden box. So whether that is people in Kansas City that I know that I say, hey, go meet Sally and Sandeep great people. They work there and I've worked with them before. And so why don't you go hang out with Sally and Sandy? Let me make that introduction for you to help you with your relationship life factor, which is ultimately going to help you at work. So absolutely, Joe, you're spot on there. So we've been talking a lot today about what leaders can do and sort of the onus on leadership, but I'm wondering about the role that non-leaders can play in their own process of blooming. What would you advise a non-leader to do to get started if they're feeling just a little bit stunted at work. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think you've uh, touched on something really interesting and um, critical. And that is, yes, leaders have 
I would argue a human, if not at times, a uh, business and fiduciary responsibility to be having these humane type conversations with team members. But whether you're a leading a team or not, it all really starts with you. So as a human being, you, you need to show up in the mirror every day and say, well, how am I? Who am I? And how do I want to be known today? And so if you're not aware of how you're feeling with these work and life factors, I mean, you've got to do some homework. And quite coincidentally, there's a free assessment that you might want to take that sort of allows you to see where you might stand and stick on the sort of the proverbial two by two matrix of work and life. And you brought up the one of the personas. There's four stunted. So the other three, obviously, blooming being one. Let's hope for that high work, high life. But then you might be budding or you might be in renewal. And they're all perfectly fine. You just need to know what you are. And if you need to work on some of those things as a human being and maybe have a conversation with your boss and say, you know what, I'm not feeling my well-being is up to snuff here and my relationships need a little bit of tending to. I was wondering if you could help me out, boss. And that's what we want. We want rapport. We want collegiality. We want communication. We want openness. And then, hey, remember we started uh, the interview first with trust? That builds up trust between the two people anyway. So why not start there? Yeah, you're not going to get the flourishing uh, that you don't put in the time to try to cultivate. So there's efforts and actions here that have to be undertaken by both leaders and non-leaders to make that work-life bloom actually come to fruition. Yeah, I mean, could have cheekily called the book Work-Life Gloom, but it's not very positive. So uh, let's let's not go there, right, Joe? <laughs> the book is Work-Life Bloom. The author, and I feel like we've bloomed today in this conversation, is Dan Ponifrak. Dan Thanks for sharing your wish with us today. Joe, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. And thanks for what you're doing. You're certainly making a huge difference in this world of ours.